So in this next segment, well, let's let's talk about the management of the of the patient with prostate cancer who's been diagnosed, had a biopsy, and there's obviously many things that go into um, what whether to do active surveillance, and which was well beyond the scope of this program. But let's talk about as the patient progresses from localized disease to advanced disease. So we know that traditionally there are multiple options that are available to patients, and I think we all agree that, that if a patient has prostate cancer, A, number one, they have the right to know that they have prostate cancer, and number two, the therapy involved needs to be an informed uh, discussion between the patient and his physician. And so the multi the multiple options that are out there are, number one, as, we've, as, we've, as uh, we know, is becoming more and more, uh, being, should be offered more and more these days, is, is the concept of act, active surveillance and, and the criteria for active surveillance. Uh, number two is, tr is traditional radical prostatectomy, whether that be uh, with the operating room robot or continued open prostatectomy. There is uh, radiotherapy whether that be brachytherapy or uh, IMRT. There is cryosurgery. Uh, there is also, in every place but the United States, high-intensity focused ultrasound or, or HIFU. Uh, probably, in, many, in some cases, it's going to require more than one therapy. So, uh, Steve, in your experience, so a patient um, has high-grade disease, um, debating between radiation therapy, surgery, um, how do you approach those patients generally? So in the uh, localized uh, high-risk patient, someone who may have advanced T-stage, whose Gleason score may be uh, eight or higher, whose PSA may be over 20, uh, we worry uh, as our institutional practice that in the setting of surgical intervention, we might actually leave factors behind that would lead to ultimate radiation therapy, such as extra capsule extension, seminal vesicle involvement. We, as an institution, argue towards radiation therapy to try to spare patients to have one modality. Although we know the fact that, you know, if we did surgical intervention, in the majority of patients, we probably would get the cancer out. But as a radiation oncologist, we try to fit that one, you know, one modality to try to take care of a pro this particular problem. Do you give them hormone therapy with that? So I think that the landscape is, is shifting with respect to hormonal therapy. The classic board answer would be two and a half years based on uh, two seminal trials, one that gave three years of hormonal therapy, one that gave two years of hormonal therapy. A two and a half year period seemed like a reasonable compromise. But of the men who sit in, the in my exam chair, I would say that most men do not want to be on hormonal therapy and want to minimize the amount of hormonal therapy. I think we're seeing that as newer agents come out, there may be a fundamental shift that we give a little bit less hormones up front and maybe more on the back end. But I think the standard answer has still been two and a half years of hormones. So you do give them hormone therapy? Yes. Yeah. So you're not giving them one treatment, you're giving them two? So the only option they have to be cured with one treatment is surgery. I think in terms of, uh, again, the toxicity profile of what we're seeing with certain modalities, I think the men who go through advanced radiation techniques in today's world, um, you know, there is a, there's a symptom profile which may be uh, reminiscent when combining what you talk about is hormonal therapy, which may be very comparable to a one modality of surgery. As one who uh, is an uh, NIH fellowship trained surgical oncologist, I like the idea very much of surgical intervention to deal with problems. Uh, I also know as a radiation oncologist that unfortunately as a surgeon, we're not right all the times. And we need to, some, in, in radiation oncology, there is, an area of treatment that includes the prostate, the seminal vesicles, and when you look at the fields, sometimes the regional nodes. Um, and that may obviate in some of the higher risk patients um, just taking the prostate and the seminal vesicles. I, I also think we've gotten better though, surgically. I mean, we haven't stayed at the same place we were five, 10, 15 years ago. 
I, I think that, that as we do these procedures with the robot, for example, I, I think a number of us that, that are experienced with the robot, you know, our eyes become our, our hands and, and we can see, you know, the different types of tissue a little more closely and we do better operations. You know, we're seeing continence levels that are really quite good. Um, we're seeing potency levels that are reasonably good, which when you give hormonal therapy, I think, you know, does have implications in these, these side effects. So uh, in, in some ways, I, I, I believe Steve when he says, you know, you're actually doing two treatments rather than one, where if, if you can get a, a patient that's got negative margins, you know, maybe have some extra capsular extension, but the margins are negative, no involvement in seminal vesicles, lymph nodes are negative, You'll need to follow those patients, but you may prevent him from going on to needing radiation therapy. So, you know, our approach has been a little bit different. I mean, we, we present everything, you know, we have them meet with a radiation oncologist and this idea of a multidisciplinary, you know, approach where, you know, uh, you have an oncologist, a, a radiation oncologist, and a, and a surgeon meet with each patient. It's an individualized decision that you make. But I would argue that we're better now than we were five years ago surgically, and we can achieve results that are really pretty good for some of these patients, especially with the quality of life. And I, I think, I was going to say one, one last thing. It's, it's not necessarily that I'm trying to say surgery better than radiation, and we, and we can beat that. But for me, I think, you know, as we talked about, you know, active surveillance being a accepted treatment for low-risk disease, we need to accept that our current treatments for high risk are not enough. And so it doesn't come, what's the one treatment I can do that can cure him, but I want all of the above. I want surgery, plus radiation, plus hormones. I'm gonna do full court press, and this is the guy that I want to prevent from getting to the CRPC in advance and needing all these new drugs that we have, if I can cure him now, so I want all of the above. So to me, started, it becomes a timing issue, surgery we, first, radiation. We really have started to do that. I mean, in the old days, we used right. to say if you received radiation, you know, the chance of a salvage prostatectomy led to very high rates of incontinence and impotence. You know, now, robotically, we're doing those types of patients really on a much more frequent basis. We, you know, we used to worry about rectal injuries with these patients really that risk in an experienced hands, and I think this is where the differentiation becomes. It's you need to go to a surgeon that has done these types of patients. I mean, the data is out there that experience really does make a difference. So it's not just the robot, though. I no, mean, and I, it isn't. There, I, 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 there's been a lot of progress in open prostatectomy no, still. No question, and so, perineals even. Uh, yeah, and, and I, one of the things we're doing in these salvage, we've been doing salvage this for a long time, is doing them perineally. And uh, you can actually send the patient home the same night. Uh, and, you know, it's not as expensive as a robot. You know, there's a lot of hype about robots and there's hype about a lot of things and, and protons and various other things in prostate cancer. And I think you got to separate that and, uh, and, and really focus on what the right thing is for the patient. Yeah, the and I, and I, would, I would echo the uh, sentiments of, of the panelists in that. On the radiation side, I think that it's very much like surgery in that it's not just writing a script for radiation, IMRT, whatever words you want to use. When we build the models of what we're aiming at, it's very much like surgery and how well that model is constructed and delivered, both by the advanced physics team as, as well as the physicians and the therapists, that it's really like surgical intervention that when you build these models, you want to have it done at a reputable, quality-driven place. The other point I think that is key from the panelists is the timing of, of putting these modalities together, about working together. It can't emphasize enough the multidisciplinary concept. It, in our institutional practice, if you have low-risk prostate cancer and someone comes in to see me, per se, I will not treat them unless they've seen the urologist. I think it's in today's world and coming into 2014, you have to function in a multidisciplinary fashion. Otherwise, the patient is not hearing the whole story. I think, I think there's so much.